all photo credits to Paramount Pictures. All right, I don't want any copyright violation here. All these pictures come from them. I didn't make it, so we're going to take a look at their movie, Noah. Why does Noah matter? Well, as I said already, everything can be seen from the perspective of the tree of life or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We can view this movie and ask, is it accurate or inaccurate on the one hand? Or we can ask, is there anything redemptive? Is there anything life-giving? Is there anything that is gospel content? Is there something we can use that would bring people closer to Jesus? That is the tree of life. And anything you look at can come from that perspective, the tree of life. To the extent that we teach people that if you want to reach the most unreached people in the world, the people from the Buddhist background, the majority of people on earth are Asians, the majority of Asians come from a Buddhist background, and I go around, God sends me all over Asia to teach people, instead of criticizing what's right and wrong about Buddhism, forget it. Look at what's redemptive. Look at what's similar to the Old Testament in the, Buddha, in the Buddhist religion. Because the Old Testament prepares the heart for the New Testament, and Buddhism is very similar to the Old Testament. And that is looking for life, looking for something redemptive in something that you may rather criticize, rather judge, but it will not do anything but lead people to death. Do you understand? That's what God has, has raised, uh, you know, partially raised our ministry for, is we have been offering this perspective of the tree of life to people who are living in Buddhist countries and reaching out to Buddhists. And it's revolutionary. It changes the way they evangelize. It changes the way that they relate to their own family members. And people get saved. And that's all we want in the end. We don't want a PhD in world religions. We want people to know the Creator God. So how about we approach the movie Noah from that perspective? Would that be better? All right. Now, I understand that a lot of people watching this are going to still be uh, vehement about their criticism for the movie Noah because they insist it is inaccurate in many ways, and I agree. So I'm going to have to touch on those things to let them know I'm not ignorant of the fact that there are inaccuracies. I'm just saying, is there something redemptive? Can we look beyond? And that's what we're going to try to get you to do today. The second reason, and I think equally important why we should care about the movie Noah, is that it's come at a particular time. It's come at a time where we pro prophecy teachers believe that the signs of the end times are upon us. And for us to understand the end times, Jesus gave us one big clue. Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, verse 26, And as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Jesus was the one who said Noah is important in the last days. Jesus said Noah is prophetic. In other words, the events of Noah's day it is a prelude to or a model for the events of the last days. If you understand Noah, you're going to understand eschatology. And conversely, if you don't understand Noah, which obviously a lot of people don't, judging by their reaction to the movie Noah, if people don't understand creation, they don't understand uh, angels and demons, they don't understand eschatology, they watch Noah, they might even assume some things are unscriptural, when in fact they're probably more scriptural than most Christian movies that have been made. So again, I'm not going to jump on the bandwagon and criticize them. I'm going to try to look for something that is redemptive and good and that can be used. Are you with me? And I believe it points to the end times. I believe the fact that it's made now, in 2014, released now, at the time when the first blood moon of the lunar tetrad the eighth lunar tetrad that we've been talking about, the fact that it's released in the same year, the fact that it's released at the time when Iran is probably very close to nuclear weapons if they don't have it already, the fact that Syria is just, just, just under, uh, it's a bloodbath, the fact that it's happening now, I think it's prophetic. I think it's a sign from God that this movie has probably done more to evangelize the story of Noah worldwide than most Christians who are criticizing it. 
Would you agree with that? More people now know the story of Noah than most Christians that are critical. Isn't God wonderful? Isn't God amazing? Was, was this movie made up by a believer? No. It's made by, by an atheist, proudly an atheist. But can God use an atheist for his purpose? You better believe it. He does it all the time. Amen? And when Hollywood takes an interest in the Bible, right, unless they blaspheme God in some way, which I don't think they did in this movie, I think we Christians should tell him. We support that. We want more of this stuff. You guys got the multi-million dollar budget to do this. That's good. That's good. Let's see more of this. But anyway, let's, let's start from the perspective of uh, what is uh, inaccurate about the movie. All right? For sure, there are inaccuracies. In the movie, by the way, how many people have seen the movie? Raise your hand. Okay, all right. So more than half the people. All right. I'm sorry. I'm going to spoil it for others who have not seen it. All right, but I guess you're going to make a decision anyway whether you're going to see it or not. So hopefully this helps. Shem, Ham, and Japheth in the movie were less than 100 years old at the time of the flood. Obviously inaccurate. All right, they were all full grown men when they entered the ark. Uh, The adult age wives of the three sons were missing on the ark. Obviously, if you compare it to the Bible, inaccurate. In the movie, Noah struggles with um, whether man should survive along with the animals. And uh, he came to the conclusion, which is a gospel conclusion, that man is so sinful that if man continued to live, man would repeat all of the pain and suffering that was going on in the world in those days. So Noah kind of saw into the future. He saw through the corridors of time, and he said, my own children will start World War I, World War II, World War III. And so if if we don't live, maybe that just kind of ends the suffering. And that was a struggle inside of a righteous man in this movie. All right? But the movie goes so far as to claim that he almost killed his granddaughters to prevent the future suffering that he foresaw. Obviously inaccurate. Is the heart right? Is the heart life-giving? Possible. I think it leans towards the gospel, but inaccurate detail, I would concede that. Sure, the movie depicts a world full of sin. The earth was filled with violence, and it looked desolate before the flood, and I thought this was fascinating. No Christian movie had ever depicted the world so desolate in the days of Noah. Was it that way? I would say, look, artistic license. None of us know what it was like at that time, but there's a little bit of leeway to imagine this because the Bible does say in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 11, but the Lord saw the wickedness of humankind that it had become great on the earth. Every inclination of the thoughts of their minds were only evil all the time. Verse 11, the earth was ruined in the sight of God. The earth was filled with violence. What does that look like? An earth filled with violence. Hard to depict, I think they did a fairly good job. In the movie, when the flood comes, Noah closes the door. Of course, you and I know, according to Genesis chapter 7, verse 16, God closed the door. Because it's symbolic, just like God closed the door to Noah's ark, God is going to close the door to the age of grace. When the last sinner repents and believes in his son Jesus Christ, God will say, The age of grace is closed. No man, no minister, no pastor, no evangelist can close that door. God will say, time's up. And he will. He will do that, not man. So, yes, in that detail, the movie is inaccurate. There were three main characters in the movie Noah. Again, I don't know any other Christian uh, version of this that is so accurate. This is completely accurate. There were, at the same time, living together, Noah, Tubal, Cain, and Methuselah. We can't even teach this to most Christians. They don't even know the genealogy in Genesis. But now, thanks to the movie, we can freely talk about it because you can imagine a famous Hollywood actor with each of these personalities. Here we go. Let's talk about them. Noah and Tubal, Cain were contemporaries. Here are their genealogies. The Midrash, the Jewish tradition, says that Noah's wife 
Naima was Tubal Cain's sister. Did you know that? No. The book of Jubilee says that Noah's wife, Emzara, and sometimes people just have two names. It could be that they're both accurate, could be that one's right, one's wrong. We don't know. We don't put as much authority on extra biblical sources, but remember the Jews have the complete story. This is their family story. So they have other sources and other texts that elaborate on the main story, which is in the Bible. We consider the main story in the Bible the uniquely inspired Word of God. But it doesn't mean everything else is wrong. Amen? So uh, they say in the book of Jubilees that Emzara was the daughter of Rachel, which was the granddaughter of Methuselah. And again, both can be right because you can have multiple ancestors leading to one person, but they emphasize different sides of of the family tree. Um, If Noah's wife was the granddaughter of Methuselah, the timeline is perfect. And the movie Noah gets it right. Let's talk about Tubal Cain. Who is he? Tubal Cain was the king of Ur, which is the city that Abraham came from, Ur of the Chaldees in present day Iraq. He was a dictator, a global dictator, about 5,000 years ago. He was a forger of bronze and iron. So this is fantastic. The idea that uh, men were Neanderthals and cavemen and dumb, uh, you know, in the biblical era, completely wiped away by this movie. People were smart. People made weapons. People know how to, uh, you know, fight wars with uh, weaponry. That's exactly what the Bible teaches. Uh, Both Noah and Tubal Cain were called the sons of Lamech, but they were different Lamechs. So you'll find that there's a godly line and there's a, a, you know, a little bit of an ungodly line. Obviously, that's not perfect. There are ungodly people and godly families. There are godly people and ungodly families. But basically, there's two lines going, line of Seth, line of Cain, and they often like to name, you know, their descendants with the same name around the same generation. So both these characters had fathers with the same name. Tubal Cain's father was Lamech. Noah's father was Lamech. Uh, Very good. The movie gets that right, and most Christians have very little idea about these genealogies. That is correct, according to Genesis 4, verse 22. Accurate. Tubal Cain opposed Noah. Now, this is not specifically detailed in the Bible, but timeline-wise, it works. And in terms of pattern, it also works because this is the biblical pattern. We find Nimrod opposed Abraham, Ishmael opposed Isaac, Esau opposed Jacob, Pharaoh opposed Moses, Sanballat opposed Nehemiah, and the interesting thing is all of these opposers of godly people may actually be related to one another, which then projects to the end time scriptures an interesting hypothesis that the Antichrist may be a descendant of all of these people, may be a blood relative of all these guys. All right? Just an interesting um, sideline thought there. Okay? But Tubal Cain was a real person. In the movie, he was depicted as a meat eater before God permitted men to kill and eat animals. I thought that was a fascinating detail because most Christians do not know that people were vegetarian until the time of Noah. Now, the godly people would have tried their best to eat only vegetable until Noah got out of the ark and God said, I give you uh, all of the animals to eat. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, God said to Noah, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. That means just like you used to eat vegetation before the flood, now I'm allowing you to eat animals after the flood. This is an indication that something transformed in the earth's environment. The pre-flood world was different from the post-flood world. And evidently, they got great nutrition from plants alone back then, but today, we may not get that. One of the interesting things that I've read, um, because I study on health and healing, I believe Christ is the healer, I believe the Bible tells us how to live well and long, One of the interesting things about centenarians is that uh, there isn't one that's vegetarian. All centenarians that they interviewed in some study were meat eaters and enjoyed it. Meat eaters, often alcohol consumers, some of them were smokers. None of those things mattered. 
The main thing was they ate meat. All right, so Noah said, God told him after the flood, you got to have some extra nutrition. All right, now today is the meat the same? We're injecting hormones into chicken and all that. If you don't like to eat meat, you're not against God's law or something, please don't write me emails and write bad comments in YouTube, you know, comment section. Leave me alone. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. You decide what you want to put on your table, not me. Amen? Praise God. I found this uh, prayer very interesting. I thought Tubal Cain was a very well-developed character in the movie. And um, when I heard him say this, it stuck in my mind, but I actually, you know, uh, scripted out uh, later. But Tubal Cain made a prayer just before the flood that I think best encapsulates the sinner's longing and blasphemy against God. He said, he is, he's saying to God, he says, I am a man made in your image. Why won't you converse with me? I give life, I take away life, as you do. I am like you, am I not? Speak to me. Speak to me. And he says that over and over, and there's silence. I believe that is what the sinner longs for until he gives up. And he doesn't understand the first thing about the gospel. The gospel says clearly in Proverbs 15, verse 29, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. One of the complaints of, I believe, every single atheist, all of you that are watching that call yourself atheists, if you would be honest enough to admit it, you're disappointed with God because you prayed for something that you think wasn't answered. I believe that is the main root of all atheism. It's not science. The most intelligent people in the world, the fathers of different fields of science, they were all believers in God. They were Bible readers. It's a canard that people hide behind certain scientific philosophies, which are really religious. Evolution is a religion. They hide behind that and say that there is no God, when in fact they're just disappointed people, just like Tubal Cain. They want to hear God. They want to get an answer, and they don't know how. There is a way for you to approach God. He wants you to come, but something separates you from God. It's called sin. The same way as a criminal is separated from the police or a judge. The sinner is separated from a holy God. you got to understand that. In John chapter 9, verse 31, it took a blind man who was healed by Jesus to give the answer to all atheists and disappointed prayers. He said this, we know. He says this to the Pharisees, the religious people. Couldn't figure this out. Here's a simple man who had been touched by God with a real healing experience. And he says, we know. That God doesn't listen to sinners. Every atheist who is watching right now, please understand, you should know that God doesn't listen to sinners. Why should he? Do you have a right to access anybody in the world with status, position, power, fame? Can you just call up your boss and say, I demand that you answer me. You can't even do it to your own company's boss. Why do you think you can do it to God? Pride, that's why you think that. If you humble yourself and realize God doesn't listen to sinners and he doesn't have to, he's not obligated to. But he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. And we know only Jesus perfectly worshiped God the Father, perfectly did his will. He was perfect in every, every way and therefore he can stand to mediate between us and God. He can bring us to God the Father, and then the relationship is restored. Then our prayers penetrate the clouds, go through the galaxies, and reach heaven's throne. That's why God said, you must pray to me in the name of Jesus. It's not a religious thing, it's a life thing. You don't have any access to God the Father until you've submitted, surrendered your life to his son, Jesus Christ. That's the answer to Tubal Cain. But Tubal Cain basically summarized what every sinner and atheist is thinking. I thought that was fantastic. Let's come to Methuselah, played by Anthony Hopkins. Methuselah was the oldest man to live on the earth. He lived uh, until the age of 969. He was Noah's grandfather, and he was indeed alive and serving God before the flood came. This is accurate and life-giving. 
If you've never seen this, this is the genealogy of Adam all the way to Noah. Maybe a little bit difficult to see there, but there's a line that indicates the flood. It cuts through the very end of Methuselah's life, and it says 969. That's how long he lived. Lamech, 777. All these numbers mean something. And then Noah, of course, was 600 years old at the time of the flood. So he's the only one that lived through the flood out of those patriarchs. What's interesting about that is the movie got it right. Many Christians don't know this. Many Christians, if they were told by unbelievers, oh, the Bible's oral tradition, the Bible wasn't written until the time of Moses, they would be flabbergasted. They would be thrown off. They they wouldn't know how to answer that. But think about it. Uh, Noah was able to spend hundreds of years with Methuselah. Hundreds of years. In the movie, it just says that he has a he and his family have a couple of conversations. He spent hundreds of years under the tutelage of the oldest, wisest man who ever lived. And Methuselah, if you look at the timeline, was able to spend hundreds of years with the first man, Adam. Therefore, even though Noah is 10 generations away from Adam, he was only one person away from Adam in terms of getting a true, accurate account of what happened in the Garden of Eden. It was almost first-hand account, what Noah understood. These were godly people. These were people who knew how the world got started, what was history really like. They were not dumb, and they were also able to write. One of the things I found in my research, just as an aside, because um, so I've got some Chinese listeners here. You know, the Chinese got all these Chinese medicine. No one can figure out where they get it from. What's recorded in the book of Jubilees that the most godly son of Noah is obviously Shem. Shem is the first ancestor of the Asians, including the Middle Easterners, the, the, the Semites. That's, that's where you get that word Semite from, is from Shem. And Shem was given knowledge, well actually Noah was given knowledge after he left the ark, of which plant heals which diseases. And which plants, which herbs do what for the body. He recorded this in a book, and out of the three sons, Shem took the book. So if Shem migrated to China, or eventually his ancestors did, all this knowledge spread across China to Japan to Korea, all across the Asian continent. And to this day, we still believe natural remedies, whereas the Westerners who didn't take the book believe in uh, pharmaceutical drugs, which we just found out on the news is yet another cause of another shooting. Uh, down in uh, Fort Hood, Texas, uh, if you're following the news there. So, but anyway, all this knowledge was indeed uh, uh, transmitted orally, but no difficulty in keeping it accurate because they're almost talking to eyewitnesses. Methuselah's name actually means his death shall bring. In other words, his father Enoch, who was one of the most special people on the earth, he walked so close to God that at the age of 365, the Bible says, I can't stand it anymore. I want Enoch to be in heaven with me. And he just raptured him up. He walked with God and he was not. That was Enoch. Now Enoch, in other sources of the the Jewish tradition, including the book book of Enoch, book one, I don't read the book two and book three, but uh, uh, Enoch was actually a world ruler, according to the Jewish uh, understanding. And Enoch prophesied of the second coming of Christ. That's in the book of Jude. So we know that the book of Enoch has got to be inspired or partly inspired, was accepted in the Ethiopian canon because Jude understood the book of Enoch and he quotes it in the New Testament. Now Enoch is credited with the first prophecy of Jesus' second coming. It says, behold, the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints. That's Enoch. Now Enoch names his son Methuselah which in his language means his death will bring. Bring what? The flood. The moment he dies, the flood comes. So Enoch knew about the destruction of the world. And in the movie, there is a little you know, line. That you, most people would just miss it unless you're actually deeply studying these things. You wouldn't even know how accurate and how deeply well-researched this is. But uh, Methuselah in the movie claimed When Noah told him that he had a vision of the flood, he kind of looks down and he puzzles and he says, funny that because uh, my father told me it would be by fire. And then they completely just move on. They don't even explain it. That 
is accurate. Enoch saw the destruction of the world twice. First one by a flood, another one by fire. Did he know which one would come first? I'm not sure if he knew, but he saw two destructions of the earth. First one's already come, second one is about to come. We now have the technology to destroy this world by fire. We also could have just meteorites falling on cities and nations that would destroy the world by fire, just like Sodom and Gomorrah would destroy it by fire. So that is very accurate. It was just a quick one-liner. Did anybody uh, hear that line when you're watching the movie? Yeah? Okay, see, minority of people. Minority. But that was good. Noah would indeed have regularly sought Methuselah for wisdom. That is accurate, and no Christian movie has ever depicted that, that I know. Methuselah, in the movie, understood the tree of life. He said uh, to Noah's wife, who was trying to convince him to you know, change the course of history, and uh, Methuselah withheld his judgment. He wasn't you know, wise enough to say what's right and what's wrong. And so he says to Noah's wife, who's good, who's wicked? How am I supposed to know what's right? And people can miss that, that the real godly people in the world are not experts in what's right and wrong. They've given up the judgment and they say, well, what's life? What will lead to life? How, would, how can we bring life into this desperate, painful situation? That's what godly people do. They're not religious nuts like the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the keepers of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they were the enemies of Jesus Christ. And yet most Christians would still identify with keeping, you know, the rights and wrong. I do more right than wrong. Therefore, I go to heaven. That doesn't make you a Christian. It's the same as a Buddhist, same as a Hindu. What makes you a Christian is that you've repented of your sin and chosen life. Jesus says, I am the, the right, the good. No. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nothing to do with right and wrong. Amen? So, uh, this is the essence of, what Methuselah said in this movie is the essence of avoiding the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Very well-developed character. All right, let's go to Noah, who is depicted. I keep hearing, hearing a Christian say, oh, he was so dark. Well, here we are preaching that, you know, according to Romans chapter uh, 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every man's a desperate sinner, lost, in need of a savior. And then when a movie depicts one of our heroes of the Bible character as a plain sinner, just like us. We're all upset. Oh, the movie's too dark. Noah struggled with the sin of his own family and in his own life. And I think that is completely biblical. Noah's uh, prayer life was depicted a few times. You can see that Noah doubted himself and his ability to hear God shows that he was humble. This is accurate. This is the way that God speaks to most of us. He does not make it all plain from A to Z to Alpha to Omega. In fact, God always requires faith in his people. He speaks enough for me to take the next step. If I obey, he will instruct me more. And if I don't obey, it often seems like God is silent. So when God seems silent to us, what do we do? Go back to the last thing that he said. He hasn't changed his mind. You may think that God has changed his mind. He hasn't. Whatever the last thing was, go back to it and obey. And you find that Noah's prayer life was like that. I thought that was very good. Now here's the real controversial one. In this story of Noah, we find the watchers. The watchers. Now, the watchers are a class of angelic beings, and they do exist in the Bible. Some were good, others were evil, and they were not the Nephilim. So if you need to understand this, please go and catch up on all the teachings I did on the Nephilim, okay? We did like four hours on the Nephilim. And I even heard uh, yesterday somebody got saved. Praise God. Somebody got saved because they used to believe in some occult thing. Then they found out the Bible explains who the Nephilim were, and so they decided that they'd rather believe the Bible and came to Jesus. So even though you may mock and you may think, what's that? It's far out. It is in the Bible. 
Okay, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that you don't know and that I don't know. We're all studying it and learning it. But the watchers were certainly there. If you didn't know, King Nebuchadnezzar saw a watcher in Daniel chapter 4, verse 13 to 14. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher. Please say watcher. A holy one coming down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, verse 17. Uh, he, the watcher sentences Nebuchadnezzar to seven years of demotion. He loses his throne. He loses his power and status for seven years. Becomes like an insane man. And then he says in this vision, this decision is by the decree of who? The watchers. Who are they? And the sentence by the word of the holy ones. In other words, there are good watchers, good angels. What are they doing? Watching humanity. I've never seen any Christian movie depict this, and here it is in the Bible. I think sometimes Christians get too proud and think that the secular world got it wrong, when in fact they probably got it more right than we think. In order that the living may know, here's the reason for the judgment, that's, that we may know something, here it is, that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will and sets it over the lowest of men. He says, I want you to learn something. I want you to be humble and learn that no matter how great you are, no matter how e e expansive is your kingdom, there is another king over your kingdom. No matter how rich you are, no matter how successful you are, there is another king over your kingdom. And one of the purpose in life is to find out who this king is. Amen? We are not our own God. That is idolatry. There are other references, but I'll, I'll just quote you a few. Daniel chapter 8, verse 10, the little horn, which is usually equated to the Antichrist, uh, is spoken of here. Its power reached to the heavens where it attacked the heavenly army, throwing some of the heavenly beings and some of the stars to the ground and trampling them. So another metaphor for the heavenly being is stars. Everyone say stars. Stars are a symbol or a metaphor or a type of angels in the Bible over and over. Agree? All right. Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, his, that's uh, the dragon, Satan, his tail drew a third of who? The stars of heaven. Are we talking about, you know, a star the size of the sun? Are we talking about that kind of star? No, that would destroy the whole earth. We're not talking about that. We're, we're talking about meteorite-sized stuff threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth and to devour her child as soon as it was born. So you find from Old Testament all the way to the last book of the New Testament, angels are stars that can fall to the earth. Well, what are falling stars? Meteorites. And what are meteorites? They're rocks from outer space entering our atmosphere and crashing. So you know what? Fallen angels encapsulated in melted rock is a fitting metaphor for the watchers. Again, very few Christians have done their homework about angels, demons, different classes of them, the history of them. Some of them just dismiss it and say, well, it's an allegory. Well, if you think that way, obviously you're going to be confused about the rest of it. If you take it literally, as God does, then it becomes clear. So, yes, it may be artistic license, how, you know, Ugly they were and all that, but not so far from the truth, okay? So we've covered uh, these watchers. Now, one of the complaints uh, from Christians about the movie is that you find the watchers or the angels helping Noah as he's trying to obey God. So my question is, do we believe angels help humans? I think every Christian in every church believes that angels help humans. But then when we watch a movie where angels help a human, we say, how dare they depict that? We say we believe one thing and then we act like we believe the opposite thing when it's actually shown accurately. So let me show you in the scriptures. Psalm 91, verse 11 to 12. Do angels help humans? For he that is God shall give his angels charge over you 
to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they will bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. Psalm 91, a great promise of protection. Angels are a part of our promise of protection. They are on assignment to protect us. It's the reason many of you have not died. And you know it. Having been through many accidents since childhood, angels were there protecting you. Luke chapter 4, verse 10, God's word translation, scripture says, he will put his angels in charge of you to watch over you carefully. Here's a Christian reading the Bible. We believe angels are present. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Another name for angels are ministering spirits or servants of Christians. So, we believe angels attend church meetings. Right now, you're not alone. There are angels here. If you could see in the spirit, there are angelic beings that are acutely interested in a godly meeting of the saints. We believe they're here watching over us. We believe they're present during our sleep. But we don't believe that they would help Noah. No. Nope. Noah only has the biggest task in the world to save the entire human population. But how dare the movie makers assume that the angels would protect Noah? And the angels protect me. Yes, of course, I need help. But Noah doesn't need any help at all. What do you think? In, in, a, in, a, in a contest between who needs more help, Noah saving the entire planet and all humans, all, all humans and animal species, or you when you need to study and do your job, and when you go to sleep and you're afraid of the dark, who needs more help? Yeah, okay. It's logical, isn't it? And why does it seem so mythical and mystical to us that a movie would show angels help Noah? Of course they would. Of course. What else would they be doing? Would, would there have been anything more important going on on the planet at that time? Huh? Were the angels helping people uh, pass their exams at that time while Noah was building the ark? Were the angels helping a housewife cook her last meal? What do you think the angels were doing? I bet you there was a concentration of angelic activity around this one man and his family. And that's never been shown by any Christian movie. Thank God, finally, somebody got it right. You see, but we're blinded from seeing the redemptive part of the movie because the voice of Christians is criticism, judgment. It's wrong. It's inaccurate. And you know what the world gets? You know what picture they get of us? We're a bunch of mad Christians. All they hear is what we stand against. We don't have anything to offer. We don't make better looking movies, but we're just going to stand and criticize everybody. Isn't that a pathetic image to present of our Lord Jesus Christ? I think it is. I'm sorry. I think, you know, some people will be offended by that, but I'm not saying it's a great movie, completely accurate. I never said that. I'm just saying, look for some life. Look for something that is redemptive and good. Amen? The true significance of all this is that there is redemption for sinners. Even Noah himself was a sinner, and we all are sinners. And the redemption is provided by God. The ark is made of wood as a representation of the cross of Jesus Christ that's made by wood. It will fall on our knees at the cross of Jesus and believe that he, the sinless Savior, can save us. Then we will go through that door of salvation. John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. My job is just like Noah, a preacher of righteousness. My job is to make an invitation to you and ask you, would you give up your life of sin, even though it's so pleasurable, even though it looks like you're going to live forever? Give up your life of sin and come to Jesus. You don't have to try to be perfect. You don't have to change religion. You need to surrender to the Creator God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to die and resurrect again for us, and you shall be saved. All right, I want to ask you to stand, and we're going to offer a, a, an invitation to pray. If anyone is not yet a Christian and you're listening to this DVD, it is very simple to become a Christian. It's not easy to be a Christian, but it is simple to start a relationship with God. What I'd like you to do is out of the sincerity of your heart, say, forgive me, Lord. 
and put your trust in Jesus to save you rather than in religion or in do's and don'ts in good or evil. Don't take from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Take from the tree of life, Jesus' life. Are you ready? Let's pray this prayer together. God is listening and he will answer. Say, Dear Lord, I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me for my pride, my mistakes. Wash away my past. From today onwards, I put my total trust in the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my ark of salvation. He is my tree of life. He is the forgiver of sins. He died to pay for my sins. He rose again from the dead. He defeated death and hell. So I put my trust in you. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Show me the purpose of my life. And take me to a good church. Where I can belong. Where I can grow. As a disciple of Christ. I pray this sincerely. In faith. In the name of Jesus. Thank you for answering my prayer. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, congratulations. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, you are in the Bible, born again. You're in the kingdom of God. And now life is going to change. From your heart, things will begin to change from the inside out. I'm very glad for you. Before we go, I just want to remind you that we covered the story of Noah uh, many times. Uh, it's in our audio-visual tour of the Old Testament called 4,000 Years of History from Creation to Christ. It's 12 hours of the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi. It's a curriculum that's been used in many churches, cell groups, and uh, I just uh, encourage you to avail yourself to that. If you don't know the Old Testament, you'll never understand end times. You'll never understand the book of Revelation. So get that foundation first. If you're interested in just scientific evidence about Noah's flood, global flood, I gave you a little bit, but session three of 4,000 years of history gives you the complete picture. I couldn't do any more than that. I packed it in as much as I can so that you'll be able to give this DVD to other people. Praise the Lord.